So welcome to day two of OSPOCon. Um, thanks for coming. Um, so my talk is going to be kind of fast, cramming a lot of material in a very short time frame. Um, come with me with questions afterwards, because I will love to answer them. Mine is basically 100% open source, and why academic and government OSPOs should be using a 100% open source platform. So first of all, what do I mean by 100% open source? Well, I mean open source in all the directions. I mean using open source tools. I mean contributing back upstream to those tools. I mean downstreaming all of the other different aspects that you do for running those tools. Like for example, right now we're working on having a um, containerized big blue button platform. And then cross stream with a lot of those other different groups so for any other changes that they may be adding into your platform um, through good uh, branching methodologies. And the other thing that I wanted to remind on people on this for 100% open source is contributions are more than just code. It doesn't just end with Git. You have documentation, you have leadership, you have marketing and evangelism, you've got all of these other different types of assets that you need to um, look at and work towards. So one big question to always ask yourself is, if it's not 100% open source, are you really collaborating in a, in a balanced environment or are you beholden to someone else? And I think that's a very important concept for academic institutions and governments, in that you don't want to be beholden to anyone else. And also, open source without community, it just isn't sustainable. You know, I know there's been a lot of different talks about commercial open source, open core, open this, open that, whatever. If you don't have that key community and the community doesn't have control, there's no sustainability in regards to it. So one reason I wanted to focus on academia and governments is because I believe they have the strength to help take open source to the next level. Um, because of the fact that academia and governments always think long term. It's not in the term of the next two to five, three years. They're often looking at the decades, 100 year path. So what's some of the gains from being 100% open source? Well, yesterday we heard from Stephen Jacobs at OpenRIT, and we heard from Saeed over at Johns Hopkins. You know, one big bear is policies. And right now, and the policies are hard and complex, and the majority of the work that's out there is very software developer-centric in focus. And that's not accurate. That's not an accurate view of open source. A more accurate view of open source would be looking at all of the other community members. And I see some of y'all in here that aren't developers. <laughs> <laughs> right, and we're all contributing, but we don't have a clear path forward to always getting those contributions and that kind of um, recognition. And then the other thing that happens is when you work on policies as a group, you get buy-in, and you're actually able to get past some of those blockages that happen. If you're going through and you're trying to get an academic institution or a government to adopt something that's proprietary and they have no control over, you have all of these stopping points where they're like, it doesn't meet this, it doesn't meet that, it doesn't meet this. If you bring all those groups together and say, how can we make you happy? What can we do in regards to this to do that? You can move forward. And it's really hard to do that with a proprietary solution. And of course, once again, long haul. I can't really stress that enough. The other thing are the students themselves. Again, with the diversity portion, it's not just devs out there. And you know, as Stephen talked about, and I'll talk about it again, it goes way beyond the computer science department. And there's a lot of other different needs in regards to open hardware, open data, and open research. And the current set of tools are not there yet. And we need to get them there. The next one is identity. Universities, I think, understand this better than most in regard because, hey, alumni, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> And going through and doing that. For this, we can incentivize a lot of different um, groups have been talking about, we don't know where our developers are. We don't know where our open source is. We don't know where this is. We don't know where, where that is. If you do have a centralization spot where they can come and be inclusively brought in and incentivized, then they will actually bring it to you and you don't have to run around chasing them everywhere. They'll come to you and have it. And not only that, but you can also make it easier to collaborate with other institutions in regards to that. So how is help, help, open source helping students? Um, you know, we've got the default one that y'all are all already probably completely used to, the computer science department, right? There's the training, there's the recruitment, and all of this stuff is really similar to all of the corporate OSPO reasons. 
in regards to that. So if you want to go and look up all those things, I'm sure you've been hearing a lot of those previously as to why open source is awesome and why open source wins. The majority of the stuff here is very developer centric and it'll totally give you all of the major reasons for that. <clears throat> but again with the role diversity, it goes way beyond the computer science department. When Stephen had that open call, he said he had 50 different faculty and students show up from 37 different departments. Everyone, a lot of groups now realize they need to be participating in regards to this. You know, library sciences, that's a more obvious one, but some become a little bit less obvious, like communication, marketing, design, business leadership and management. If you are at a corporate company and you don't understand how to manage open source, you're going to have some problems. Trust me, I've seen it in action. And then all the different stuff that's happening behind the whole concept of open research and for medicine, mechanical engineering, things of that nature. All of those groups are now getting more and more involved in regards to what we traditionally call open source. But it's all of, uh, I think, Stephen, was it you that called it the opens? You know, open hardware, open science, open data, all of that. Open work. Awesome. Open work. Um, and so one of the advantages by going through and doing something 100% open source is you do get to go beyond citations in regards to that. Because like right now, you've got search. You're good. You've got that. OK. Um, but you can go beyond that. You can start giving credit to a lot of other different things and a lot of different other roles and responsibilities and work that's done in regards to supporting these communities. So you can have things like the community creation, you can have identifiers and badging and community peer recognition. There might be some form of ongoing support for alumni and tenure so that they can also be engaged. And you can do reporting beyond convenient data. The majority of the reporting that we see being done right now in open source is all convenient data. It's lines of cold, pull requests, issues. Even, you know, we have a wonderful person in the audience who did a presentation on it yesterday. You have the spikes that occur that she was talking about, but you still always have to go and dive in as to why those spikes occurred, what was actually going on, things of that nature, because that convenient data doesn't give you that information. But if you were accruing more information from all of these diverse roles, you would actually know more. Um, also, foundations are really looking towards this. Um, both the UN Foundation and Rockefeller are doing something called DIO, which is a Digital Impact Alliance, and they've been going through and evaluating different open source projects. And they're evaluating that for their grant funding and for a bunch of their different humanitarian causes and things of that nature. And that one of the major um, measures that they're looking at is quality. When are these things safe for everyone to use? Do they, are they mature enough? Do, are they sustainable? They're going through and looking at all of these different metrics in regards to it, as is, of course, chaos, which we're highly involved with. And, um, and then there's an, another new initiative called ACROSS, which is with um, Ocean and Google, where they're also doing that kind of work, too, and looking at um, those different metrics for saying they're saying, how do we actually sit there and see what some of those additional community metrics can look like, um, not just the software metrics. So those are a bunch of the different aspects that they're looking at for that. And then the other thing that needs to happen is we need so much more than Git. OK, guys, don't get me wrong. I love me some Git. I, love, I, I have to admit, at very first, after Subversion, I did go to um, the mercurial dark side. But after that, I went over to Git. Um, but we, de we do need to do more than that if we are going to support all of these other you know, versions of open, like hardware, um, data, and processes and research even design and a bunch of those other different aspects. There's so much more that we have to go through and do. And a lot of other corporate entities aren't chasing that dollar, just to be bluntly. So if we want to do things like support reproducibility, support publishing and reviews and do all that, we've got some big changes that we have to make. So um, you know, once again, y'all all know why open source is awesome. You're here. I don't need to like preach to the choir. Um, but I want to say yes and in regards to that because academia and government is always looking in decades instead of years. And oftentimes proprietary tools are a little bit more focused on more commercial entities and their needs and not the, the needs of academia and government, especially not in regards to policies. And that's why I would like to you know, encourage all of you to join you know, OSPO++ 
if you are interested in academia and government because it is the place to be because they are going through and defining all the things that are very different about an open source program office in academia and government that is not the same as corporate. It's like, yes, you do have IPR, you do have licensing issues, you do have this, but it's all very of a very different flavor in regards to that and also has way, it also has bigger differences in regards to ownership that can get very complex. So what does standards and open source have to do with academia? Well, I think we're great partners. Um, you know, IEEE has a very big academia background and there's a reason for that. And uh, there's a reason why, you know, the members are there and engaged for 30 plus years. You know, they don't care what company they work for or anything along those lines because they want things done, you know, the right way, the good way, the sustainable way. And, um, and so one of the things that happens with standards is they really help raise the level of maturity. And that's where we're at with open source. With doing things like solar winds and also what happened way back in the day with Sol SourceForge, we need to have these different steps to you know, getting things production ready and to a state of maturity and not always depending on a corporation to do so. <clears throat> so again, similarities between standards and open source in academia is trust, care a lot about the safety, safety of the students, you know, getting all those things. We care a lot about measurement and the diversity of the measurement. Um, we have a long-term view in regards to publications. Our data needs to be there decades, right? And we don't just want the data, right? Because what did I say earlier? It's about the community. If we don't have that community aspect and some sustainable aspect for that, it's not going to work and it's not going to be a long-term sustainable. Um, <clears throat> we're evolving peer review right now. The academia model of peer review, one and done, doesn't work. In, in this new world that we're doing. How do we actually create different and better processes for that? And also one good thing is academia doesn't mind a few rules. They're already used to it. And so some of the different things that we're doing is best practices, better templating, automation, measurement tools, and um, working on those policies and getting to those um, pieces of consensus. So um, these are the, uh, from OpenStand. These are some of like the basic things in regards to the basic principles on standards. Um, that we all work very hard to adhere to. And I think you'll sit there and find a lot of that that's very complimentary. So join us. We're working on a 100% open source platform. Um, the community is determining the path forward. In fact, um, Jacob helps lead up the education subgroup, which did an entire proposal as to what the platform needs to be to support education properly, both K through 12 and academia, to the technical advisory group. The technical advisory group has a little group where they're actually going through what are the um, processes for approving um, new features and tools for the platforms themselves. And then this has like where you can go and click on the links. So you can go to saopen.ieee.org, click on there, join up, use the platform, begin coding, share feedback, and go on and c consider um, contributing to it. So thank you. I'm Selena Bonewald. I'm obviously biased because I'm the executive director of IEEE SA Open. And these are all the different ways you can contact me and all of the different links to the platform. Thank you.